I've been thinking about repentance as I examine my own life, the slant. <clears throat> In Hebrew, repentance means to turn to face God, which on the face of it would seem to be a simple act. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is asked, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. But to love our neighbors, we must first decide to turn and face God and our neighbor. How do some people do that so effortlessly? Why was it so hard for me? Six years ago, I started work on a new project in Dorchester, a documentary film about students in the Clemente course, a tuition-free year-long night class in the humanities a first time experience of higher education for adults who had never had that opportunity. I'd heard a Clemente grad speak at a benefit dinner and been moved by her story. Clemente grads receive six credits from Bard College. Some move on to full-time higher education. Some change their lives in other ways. From a filmmaker's perspective, it seemed promising so many stories might emerge over the course of one year. And I decided to go ahead and start, open to what might happen. My team and I arrived in Dorchester with just enough funding to film seven classes over the course of the academic year. The Clemente teachers and students welcomed us into their classroom. No one objected to being filmed. And this seemed brave to me for a group of first time college students who were expected to cite texts and argue in Socratic dialogues. I can be single-minded in my work habits. With reckoning, the narrative seemed clear. If people who had known obstacles in their lives were given the opportunity to engage with art, philosophy, literature, and history, they would transform themselves. It's a powerful idea. But as I spent more time with the students, particularly two of them, Coffee Dixon and Carl Chandler, and witnessed what they were up against each and every day in the city of Boston, I realized I was entering into uncharted territory. A lot happened during the six years. Carl, in his late 60s, spent his days caring for his grandson so his daughter, daughter could start a career as a pharmacy tech. Childcare costs were just too high. Carl's landlady threatened to turn his space into a condo twice. He was given, he was given 30 day notices. He'd been on a list for affordable housing for 11 years. Coffee was evicted from her apartment. She invited me to join her at housing court where I saw dozens of low income people enter into a brutal and chaotic encounter with the law, most without legal support. All of this was new to me. This was not the Boston I loved or thought I knew. James Baldwin once wrote, quote, that the story of the Negro in America is the story of America. It's not a pretty story. What can we do? The tragedy is that most of the people who say they care about it do not care. What they care about is their safety and their profits, unquote. I had to examine my own life. I realized that much of what Coffee and Carl faced every day was totally outside my own experience. I'd never known anyone who'd been evicted, nor the feeling of becoming unhoused as both Coffee and Carl had. I knew nothing about what goes on in housing agencies or the stories of the urban displaced, quietly transported out of Boston to start new lives. Here I was, a white suburban man, eight miles from Dorchester, 
naive in a way, protected, living in a parallel society. I thought of the neighborhoods we'd chosen to live in over the years and questioned what had motivated those decisions. In my suburban church during prayers of the faithful, I listened, expecting to hear the names of the black men who had been murdered by police week after week. But those names were never spoken. I learned about wealth disparities between white and black households in greater Boston. The average wealth for whites is $247,000 and for blacks, $8. This gap is wide and persistent. Shocking, isn't it? In a prosperous, liberal leaning, highly educated city. It was a lot to process. And the film itself was languishing on my edit system, just not coming together. I turned to Coffee and Carl for help and spent more time listening to them. It was tough to accept my failure to make the film I set out to make on my own, and instead to make myself as vulnerable as Coffee and Carl had for me, and even bring my missteps into the film narrative. Yet when I did, the film started to come together. I found myself turning. The second part in Matthew is familiar. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think the easy familiarity of this passage had numbed me to its deeper truths. My friend, Dr. Fernando Ona, when I was struggling to bring my voice into the film, asked me a simple but profound question. Why were the odds so low that you and Coffee would ever become friends? Fernando's question remains with me. When I met Coffee, she was a city bus driver, a working class black woman born and raised in Boston. I was a transplanted Midwesterner living in an affluent suburb. A friendship does seem wildly unlikely. But why is this? What does hold us back from loving our neighbors? Why have I been afraid to turn toward them all these years? Why are the structures that keep people of different classes and cultures separated so powerful and persistent? When I let down and took a breath, put aside my ego as best I could, and admitted my limitations as best I could, when I turned to my neighbors, Coffee and Carl, and asked them to join me as producers, the film began, began to come together. I turned to Coffee and Carl, and my neighbors received, loved, and uplifted me. And we created something authentic together, a reckoning in Boston. Whenever anyone asks me, what a white person can do to support racial justice, I tighten up a bit. For someone like me seeking repentance, where and how do I even begin, let alone tell anyone else? Coffee steps in with practical advice. Look first at yourself, where you live and what you do every day. If you're a teacher or a student, look closely at your institution and its policies. If you're at a college or university, find out how its development might be displacing people or question the quality and level of the contribution it's making to the neighborhoods around it. If you live in a suburb, support your neighbors who are pushing for affordable housing, buy from black owned businesses. I know any of these things are just a start. My son and I are parishioners at St. Stephen's in the South End. St. Stephen's is a warm faith community that expresses love with uncommon ease, a place that welcomed two strangers as neighbors. As Episcopalians, we can look at the history of our church here in the Commonwealth and reflect on how it benefited and benefits even to this day 
from the enslavement of black people. We should all consider what making reparations will look like. My turn to God and my neighbors was harder than it should have been. I don't think I have everything, really anything figured out about race. I slip, I recalibrate, and I'm supported by my friends and keep trying to learn from them. I'm deeply grateful to all of them. This Lent, I want to stay turned in the right direction, unafraid to face God and my neighbors. Amen.